Well, so we've been on this uh, series of messages from the Psalms all summer, and uh, uh, it's been great for me. I'm learning a lot, and uh, um, one of the parts I like best about it is when we get to hear from you, because you've been sending in the Psalms that you've written for your own life, and each week we get uh, one or two of those. So I want to read one. This is written by one of you. Oh Lord, what am I to you? As a child, wait, huh? Oh Lord, what am I to you? As a child, I prayed each and every day. My mother went to heaven with the wings of feathers. I knew she was with you and the other angels and doves. Lord, you were my heavenly father that I loved. What am I to you? In my teenage years, I bartered with you. You saved my soul and spirits hundreds of times while I broke my promises to you. Even though you could not remove me from my home, you were my sunny days and moonlight stars. You were steadfast in my years of agony. You saved my life, Lord. What am I to you? As an adult, I prayed for you to change me into your likening. I prayed for guidance and wisdom to change my life in a way I would understand. You came through again, Lord. What am I to you? In the moment of life or death, Lord, there you caught me as I fell. I prayed and fought to resume my life. You were a pillar of strength in my aloneness. Lord, what am I to you? You've been a steadfast pillar in my world and in my heart. Still, I stand here before you today asking, oh Lord, what am I to you? So keep those Psalms coming. And isn't it amazing to hear the Psalms of each, uh, each of us little by little as we go through? It's pretty amazing. I have a confession to make today. Um, the psalm that we're going to be looking at today is, is one that um, we all know parts of it. It's very familiar. I have a confession that in all my years of pastoral ministry, which are multitudinous, I have never preached on this or taught on this or done a devotional or a camp talk on it. I have never referred to this psalm ever in my ministry. So just a, a little confession. Um, so when Jeremy and Jana signed it to me, <laughs> <laughs> they're pushing me out of my comfort zone. <laughs> so um, uh, it's Psalm 91. And uh, this, is, this is like, it was known as kind of a warrior song, psalm strength and warrior song. In fact, why don't you put up the picture? Um, Ray Lewis of the Baltimore um, Ravens, when they, the day that they won the Super Bowl a year ago, uh, he had on his shirt underneath his uniform, Psalms 91, and he had it taped on his shoes as he played in the Super Bowl that day. And the big question at the end of the Super Bowl was, why? Why is Ray Lewis wearing Psalm 91? And he said, it's because I knew that I would be in a battle today and I needed all the protection and shelter of the Lord every minute. And I want to be reminded of it. So let me take it down. I just thought that was an interesting one since he was able to give a great message on it and I never have been. Um, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he'll save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You'll not fear the terror of the night or the arrows that fly by day or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, and it will not come near you. You will observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the world, of the wicked. And then it says, if you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. 
For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You'll tread upon a lion and a cobra. You'll trample uh, the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I'll rescue him. I'll protect him for he acknowledges my name. He'll call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him with long life and satisfy him and show him my salvation. That's Psalm 91, the warrior psalm. So Lord, teach us from this and uh, show us your shelter and your protection. Amen. So I feel nervous uh, even approaching this because uh, I, it's, it's been, uh, I think my aversion is, a little confession here, my aversion is that I don't want uh, anything to deny the reality of how hard life is for us. I don't want to get superficial and say, well, you know, if you pray better or you dwell with the Lord, then nothing bad will ever happen to you. You won't get hurt. You won't get sick. Uh, you'll probably live forever here on earth, you know, and uh, so far it hasn't happened for anybody. And so I, uh, and I, and maybe I've been trying to protect God's reputation <laughs> by, by not pointing anyone to this passage. And then Ray Lewis comes along and tells the whole world. And now, now what? So I've had to look at this and go, okay, John, what, what is being said here? And what does this mean for us? Not in a superficial way, but in an authentic way. What is this talking about? What is God communicating to us in this radically important psalm? Well, one thing that you can do is you can take this psalm and claim it and put it to the test and do all kinds of uh, crazy things and say, okay, Lord, show me that you're gonna do that. Show me you're gonna do that. You promised, okay, I'm never gonna be sick. Nothing bad's ever gonna happen. You're gonna protect me. Everybody else is gonna fall, not me. Go ahead, Lord, come on. And I tell you, I have heard that all my life from preachers, <laughs> you know, claim it, you know, claim it, name it, get it. Blessings, abound. no problems in your life if you have enough faith. And if, and if you have problems, it means that you just don't have enough faith. I've heard that and I've hated it. And then I realized something. This is the Psalm that Satan quoted to Jesus when he was being tempted in the desert before his ministry started. This was the Psalm that was quoted to Jesus. The first temptation was turn these rocks into bread. You're hungry, you've been out here for so long, feed yourself, you know, take care of your needs. You can do that. And Jesus said, no. And then he went to Jesus' strength, right? Said, he said, he showed him the holy city and on the pinnacle of the holy temple. And he quoted God's holy word. This. Jump. Put God to the test. Prove once and for all that he's going to do what he says. Come on, Jesus. That would really start your ministry good, wouldn't it? And I realized... What Satan was doing to Jesus and quoting this passage is what I've heard so many preachers do over the years. Go ahead and challenge it. Take it. You got it. You know? And, it, and the temptation is uh, to no longer live by faith, but try and get the kind of proof you need so you don't have to have faith anymore. You don't have to trust God because you've got the evidence right here. So... It put it in a new perspective for me when I when I realized that, and then so I started looking at it. And uh, uh, those of you who are you know um, a little younger than me remember uh, Elizabeth Elliot Leach. Remember she she and her husband went down uh, to uh, South America's missionaries years ago, and the Aka India tribe, and they killed her husband Jim Elliot. And they they killed him and they were, she was brought home. And she wrote a book, ironically, called The Shadow of the Almighty, from Psalm 91. And people asked her, how in the world could you write the story of this and use The Shadow of the Almighty when, when your husband was killed by the Indians while you were serving the Lord? How, how could you even refer to this? 
And she said, I had to take seriously what his motto was when we left, which is, um, I will gladly give up what I can't keep in order to acquire what I can't lose. And she said, you know, our life is bigger than the things around us. Our life is bigger than, than this life that we have. And, and so I thought about that and um, give you a little history lesson here. Um, I was with my, my small group of pastors. We've been meeting for about 20 years now. And uh, we were in Spokane a couple of weeks ago meeting and uh, we got into a discussion and uh, one of the guys who has a PhD in church history, so who's gonna argue with him? Uh, he's the, the, now the president of Princeton Seminary. And, and uh, so we were talking and he said, well, you know, uh, you know why the church was so bold and so strong at the very beginning when, when uh, they were being killed and wiped out and obliterated and yet the church grew and grew and grew? And I went, no, <laughs> tell me. He said it was because of the new members class. <laughs> He said they have found, historians have found all these uh, fragments and things and put together the, the liturgy of what the new members class was. And it was this involved, complicated series of questions and things leading to baptism in which you denounce Satan and you denounce all of your earthly world and you, uh, you turn your focus to Christ. And then as you're baptized, they hold you down under water that you are dead to this world and, and you have died to this world and, and you are buried. It's like, just like Jesus in the tomb, you're buried. And then when you can't hold your breath any longer, they would bring you up out of the water to symbolize the, your resurrection and your new life and your, your life in Christ. And, he's, and he said, you know, it wasn't just symbolic for them. They actually uh, believed that the, uh, the church was annihilating their new members. They were dead to this world and alive to Christ and alive to this eternal life. And, and he said that that gave them this boldness because if someone offered to, uh, uh, threatened to kill them, they'd go, I'm already dead. I've already died to this world. So it doesn't matter what you do. And, and the authorities could, couldn't uh, do anything to stop them because they were living their eternal life. Uh, and, you know, it's an interesting take, you know, that, that when we talk about we are alive in Christ, um, do we mean that? Are we serious in that? And, and we find them. So this says, you know, if you dwell in the shelter of the Most High and rest in the shadow of the Almighty, and if you make the Most High your dwelling, the Lord is your refuge, no disaster will come near you. The Lord will guard your way because it's all part of a continuation of an eternal life that you're living. And, and, and we lose our stuff here, you know, but then here's the part. I, I really, I really want to get this through to you. Um, I looked at this and looked at this and looked at this and I realized in verse five, he'll cover you, you know, still those visual images of feathers, you know, like a, a, a mother bird sheltering the, the chicks under the wings and um, faithfulness, shielding, all those things. And then it says this, you will not fear the terror of the night. You will not fear the arrow that flies by day. You will not fear the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. You will not fear the plague that destroys the midday. You will not fear that a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000, it, it, on and on and on. What's it saying? It's saying that those threats are real. They're there. It's not saying, okay, so you will never uh, have the terror of the night or the threat of war or illness or a plague or whatever it is. You, you will never experience that because you got, you're going to be walking along with a perfect carefree life. Right? That's not what it says. It says while you go through the pestilence and the terror of night terrors and while you go through the, the horrendous things that are going on around you, you will not be afraid. That's what it says. Because the Lord is our shelter our protection, guarding us, and we don't have to live in fear. And, and we've talked about this before, you know, the, the first thing, every time in the Bible, whenever God breaks into somebody's world, what's the first thing they say? Every angel, every, you know, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the shepherds, what do they say? Don't, don't be afraid. God's breaking into our world, don't be afraid. And they said, you will not have to be afraid. 
If you dwell in the shelter of the Most High and rest, and you will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. The, the, it's funny, the only thing that Jesus seemed to be really um, frustrated with and would actually scold the disciples for, you know what that was? Well, guess. Why are you afraid? He was affirming all the things. When they struggled, when they did these things, he was really generous with them. He was nice and accommodating, you know, like a good pastor would have been, you know, and uh, did all those things until he sees their fear. And then he gets ticked every time. What's with you guys? How long have I been here? What's going on? You know, and, and he'd be scolding. Jesus the scolder only over their fear. Because if you're resting in the shelter of the Most High, you won't fear the night terrors and the calamity and the threat. You won't fear it because your life is already in Him. You, you're, you're living in Him. Now, it's interesting to me that, that uh, uh, Jesus uh, was starting His ministry and Satan tempted Him with this psalm. Come on. You can do this. You can prove God's word. You can, you know, once and for all, you can make this happen. And Jesus uh, said no. And then, and then at the end of his ministry, it's, it's like he takes up the, um, the theme here. And in John 15, and he says, I am the true vine. My father's the gardener. He cuts the branches off that don't bear fruit. And he goes down, um, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Some translations say, unless you abide in me. It's the same, uh, same concept that we have in Psalm 91 of if you abide in the shelter of the Most High. If, if your life is there, and Jesus takes that now and personalizes it. You abide in me. Your life is in me now. It's not in all this stuff. It's not in all these distractions. It's not in those things. It is in me. And you don't have to live in fear. And, uh, and then it talks about angels um, back here. Now, I don't even have to confess this, you know, that uh, I'm not spooky spiritual, so... Um, I don't see angels and demons everywhere. Uh, you might, that's, that's fine. Um, but he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and they'll lift you up in their hands. So um, you know about uh, the story about when um, we were in seminary and Eileen uh, was almost murdered in a home invasion. And um, I wrote about it in, the, in uh, Getting Past What You Never Get Over, but um, there was the one part of the story that I wanted to bring out was that uh, after she was uh, beaten and uh, uh, put away in a closet, covered with blood and all those things, and then she was able to escape a little bit and lock the front door and try to call for help, and then the guy came and kicked the front door down and broke in on her, and, and she ran and fled down the street, and then went up a kind of a cul-de-sac of little bungalows, and door after door, no one would open the door. <coughs> no one would help. And one lady finally opened her door and said, just go away. Just go away. And she looked up and she was at the very end of the cul-de-sac. There was one more bungalow. And uh, she thought, oh no, if, I, if there's no help, then I have to turn around and go back to the street where the attacker is. And, um, and as she went up towards the door, the door swung open and there was a man with a gun. And he said, come in here. And there's a little boy behind him. And she went in to a bare room, bare, bare a small home, one chair, a stick of furniture, one chair, and, um, and a policeman's uniform hanging on a hook by the fireplace. And the, the man ran out with his gun, and uh, by the time I got there, um, Oh, and the little boy came up to her and gave her a piece of bread to eat. Here's some bread. Eat this. And uh, so when I got there, police were everywhere, helicopters going around, and all this going on. And they led me over to this bungalow. And, uh, and Eileen was there. And uh, 
alive. We never saw the man with the gun or the boy. They were gone. Don't know who they are. Police never mentioned them. Um, and I go, is that what it means when angels protect you? Maybe, you know, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not one to go to this naturally. But I go, her rescue, her safety was there. Now, was it a bad thing that happened? Of course. Um, could it have ended much worse? Yes. But was there someone there who opened their door and no one knows why they were there? And, and then the little boy said, have some bread. Mm -hmm. 